Good morning. Have you had anyone say Merry Christmas to you yet? A few people? November 1st, someone dared to say Merry Christmas to me. And we were in Dominican at the time, and I'm in shorts and a t-shirt, and it's hot. And I said, really, it's Christmas? And she said, yep, okay. So I, I come home, I look around, <clears throat> here we are, it's mid-December, and it's brown outside. So it feels a little weird, and I know Christmas isn't about a feeling, it's not about, uh, you know, the, the scenery outside. But I do enjoy it when uh, we get the display up front here, and we start to sing Christmas carols, it, it, it starts to get me going, and... Uh, let me uh, just show a picture on the screen for you. I don't know if this will get you into the, uh, the Christmas mood or not, but I want to show you a picture. You want to go on to that picture there, Graham? And uh, so this picture, anybody know where that is? Anybody guess? So this, in the Bible, there, it talks about the Valley of Jezreel. So in the foreground, you can see that valley is called the Valley of Jezreel, and many scholars believe that this site is also called the Valley of Armageddon, which uh, they believe is the uh, site of the epic final batter, battle that is mentioned in Revelation 16.16. 16. Today it's a, a beautiful plain. It's the, called the, the bread basket of Israel. You can see it's uh, the fertile fields and the, and the trees, and in the background there's some hills. It's a beautiful scene. And it's a bit deceptive, because where I'm taking this picture from is on a hill that's called Megiddo. That name may sound familiar. Megiddo, one article claimed, is the site of the most battles in the world. They claim that no less than 34 battles have taken place in and around this area that you're seeing on the screen. Thank you for reading our, our text this morning, Darcy and Jose, Luke 1, 26 to 38. I hope you'll turn there. And you could tell as they were reading, you could hear that the, uh, the place we're going to be talking about today is a, a city called Nazareth. And that city is actually in this picture. It's way in the background on the, on the left-hand side. The Valley of Jezreel is, or the, I should say Nazareth, overlooks the Valley of Jezreel. Now, this area has thousands of years of amazing history, and yet there is a, a high-speed train that kind of runs through the valley. So you have this ancient and modern kind of intertwined in that area. Today, Nazareth looks like this, kind of typical for any Israeli city from what I saw. And if you go up the hill further and you, take a, you turn around, you look behind you, this is the, the view that you get now take note, in the middle of the screen, there's a, a, a cone-shaped, a black roof. I don't know, can you see that in the middle of the screen? And I'll zoom in a bit. So that location, some argue, <clears throat> this is where the Christmas story begins, right in that spot. That is a Catholic church called the, the Church of Annunciation. And this is where many believe about 2,000 years ago, the story of Luke 1, 26 to 38 takes place, the story you just heard. Now, this may be exactly where it happened, or it may be close by. It doesn't change that the fact that this is an amazing, true story, and it involves a relatively unknown teenager as a key character. And many would, would say that they would consider her unimportant, and yet we still talk about her today. So we'll, we'll talk about her a little bit more, but first let's, uh, let's get into, let's pray before we open our Bibles. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for this morning. We thank you that we can gather, we can come together, we can begin this preparation, this celebration of uh, the amazing birth of your son Jesus. And Father, as we open your word today and read this story, this amazing story, we just pray, Lord, that as we look into some of the meanings and lessons that we, we find in it, Lord, that your Holy Spirit will use that to speak to us, and Lord, that we will be open. We pray that this will draw us into a closer experience with you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. The four Sundays before Christmas we call Advent, and last Sunday Pastor Daniel explained that uh, we use these Sundays, these four, to prepare, to anticipate and prepare for the birth of Jesus. Today is the second Sunday of Advent. Two candles lit. 
Last Sunday, if you were here, Pastor Daniel started us off in Luke chapter 1, and he, he got up to verse 25. I'm going to start at verse 26 and continue on, and next Sunday, Pastor Murray will kind of take the baton from me, and we'll just keep going, and, and soon will be a Christmas day. Won't take long. So let's, let's begin with our story in Luke chapter 1. I hope you're there. Verse 26. We'll start with this amazing story, and it takes place only a few months after the uh, story that Pastor Daniel covered last Sunday. And in that story, if you remember, the angel Gabriel came to an elderly priest named Zechariah, and he told him that his elderly childless wife was going to have a boy. She was going to have a boy called John. The Bible calls, later calls him John the Baptist. Now, God sends this same angel with a message, Gabriel. He has a message. This time, he's, he's not sent to Jerusalem, the big city where the palace is, and, or, or I should say the temple, the, the political and spiritual capital of Israel. No, this time, Gabriel is sent to a little village called Nazareth in northern Israel. And Nazareth an agricultural village, less than 500 people, you know, no big, beautiful buildings, no hub of anything like Jerusalem, no, it's... I think that just goes to show that you don't have to come from a booming metropolis to produce remarkable people. And Gabriel is sent to Nazareth because of a remarkable person. Rather odd and likely choice, as we'll find out, but a wonderful choice. And as I said earlier, we're still talking about her today. So the first thing that Luke points out in our story is Gabriel sent, is sent to a virgin. Now, this means a young woman of marriable age who, is not experienced, who has not experienced sexual intercourse. Her name is Mary, and she is engaged or betrothed to a man named Joseph. Now, apparently, the Jewish custom at that time, the bride was typically 11 to 13 years old, from what I read, when she would be formally betrothed to a groom who would be approximately 17 to 20 years old, typically. Now, this betrothal period was a lot more significant than our engagement period that we have today. The bride and groom would even exchange vows with each other. They were considered legally married. However, they did not live together or consummate their marriage. After the exchange of the wedding vows, vows, there was a whole year of preparation for the actual wedding. Now, during this time, the, the groom was expected to build a small house for his bride. And of course, there had to be food. And so the, uh, the groom and the bride's parents and the whole family, they would get together, they would make food, and remember, they, they don't have ready-made foods. So everything is made from scratch. In fact, it had to be grown and harvested, and so it was a, a pretty big deal. It was all made by hand, and that's why often the preparation lasted a whole year. And when everything was finally ready, the groom would go to the bride's house and bring her to his father's house, and there they would have a huge feast for seven days. Now think back to your wedding if you're married, or if you have been married, I, I want you to think back to, remember how long you planned for that one day? Now time's up by seven. That gives us an idea of why they had to prepare so long. And like today, I imagine that boys and girls back then were, as they grew up, they were excited and looked forward to their wedding. And if Joseph and Mary followed these customs, and I assume they did, their relationship was somewhere between the wedding vows and the wedding feast, somewhere in there. And that relationship could only be broken by divorce. The writer Luke goes on to tell us that Joseph was from the tribe of Judah. That makes him a descendant of King David, and that's very important. It means that in some regards, Joseph had a legal right to the throne Therefore, his descendants, including adopted Jesus, also would have that same status, a right to the throne. So let's go right to the message that we see. Let's start, I'll, read, I'll start reading from verse 28. You can follow along or listen if you don't have a Bible with you. The angel of the Lord, sorry, the angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. 
Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. Let's stop there. So troubled, confused, disturbed, whatever words your Bible uses, and, and we can't blame her. I mean, angels don't just pop in and say hi. And Mary's not a fool. She knows that something's up. Now, did you notice what troubled Mary? She didn't say, oh, no, it's an angel. It was his words. It was his words that troubled her. He said, you who are highly favored. A teenage female from Nazareth. In that society, that would say unimportant, low status. And here, God, through this angel, is calling her highly favored. The exact opposite of what her society would tell her. Now, what does that mean, to be highly favored? In this case, it means to provide someone with special honor. Now, if someone came to you and said that you were going to be provided with special honor, I think you would have some questions, too. You'd, know, you'd want to know what she's talking about, and that we can understand why Mary would say, what kind of greeting is this? Verse 30 says this, the angel said to her, do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. So again, Mary is told that she's found favor with God, and she's probably wondering, why me? And we wonder the same thing. Why her? Was she the only teenage girl in all of Israel who would have accepted God's plan? Was she the, the only virgin in Israel who would have, who was, was she the most righteous of them all, was than any of the other girls her age? And we aren't told why. We can guess. She must have loved God. And if we look at the end of this story, we know that she was a humble servant. And only God knows the real answer of why he chose her, but we know that he did choose her. She is chosen. The question is, chosen for what? And we find that out in the very next verse. Verse 31, it says, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call his name Jesus. Now, I, I read this, and I was quite surprised. I tried to do some quick research, and I think it's true. This is the first time that someone has heard the name Jesus. Mary becomes the first human to hear the word Jesus. This is the first place the name Jesus, referring to the Son of God, is recorded in the Bible. Now that name Jesus is a Greek name, comes from the Hebrew name Joshua, which means the Lord saves. Okay, before we move on, just, just something to point out. The angel tells Mary what to name him. And if we go back to Matthew, where the, the same angel met with Joseph in a dream, uh, or, I shouldn't, or when Joseph had a dream, I should say, not the same angel, but the angel of the Lord spoke to Joseph. That angel also told Joseph what to name this child. So in both cases, God told them what to name this child, and that's significant because in those days, and we have that today, parents typically name their own children, but this baby is special. And one clue is that God picked this baby's name. So Gabriel tells Mary some more uh, about her exceptional baby. We can read that. Let's keep reading. Verse 32. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him a throne, the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants. His kingdom will never end kingdom will never end. It's incredible to think that this baby had been prophesied for over a thousand years. In 2 Samuel 7, uh, the prophet Nathan said, your house and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established. So this prophecy was about to be fulfilled in this little baby through him the Lord saves. Remember what that name means? That's Jesus. This is the Messiah that they have been waiting for for so long. 
And to fulfill this prophecy, Jesus had to be a descendant of King David, and we just read verse 27. It confirms that Jesus is a descendant of King David through Joseph, his adopted father. And we learn more about this baby through the angel's description. It says that he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. That sounds like a bit of an oxymoron, doesn't it? A child will be called the Most High. Who are the most vulnerable people in our society? I think it's children. Physically, emotionally, mentally. I mean, you can't get more vulnerable than that. And yet, the Son of God is, or this person will be called the Son of the Most High, who became, we know, became totally vulnerable, putting himself in a position where he could be harmed. And we know the whole story. Jesus was eventually tortured and killed by the Romans. This is why he came. Christmas begins Christ's road to the cross. Jesus is most certainly great, as Gabriel says, and, the, and is worthy of this title, Son of the Most High. Now, the Most High, who's the Most High? God the Father is the Most High. That name emphasizes his magnificence and his authority. So as Son of the Most High, Jesus is the Son of God. Verse 33 says that His kingdom, that the, uh, Jesus' kingdom will be established and will never end. Now that doesn't mean that He's going to march into Jerusalem and, and take over the palace and kick the Romans out, which is what some of the Israelites were hoping. That Jesus had a different kind of kingdom. Christ's kingdom has been defined as the spiritual rule over our lives, over the lives of those who are submissive to God. It also includes the literal rule of Christ on earth. Someone has described Christ's kingdom in, in two stages, and I, I, this really helped me to understand this better. First stage is Jesus' ministry on earth and the suffering that he experienced on the cross as an atonement or as for paying the penalty for our sin. That's already happened. So today we, we are presently in the latter stages of that, or sorry, it should say in the latter part of that first stage. But we still benefit from Christ's kingdom. For example, His Spirit is in us, it dwells in us if we commit our lives to Him. His power to serve Him is available to us through the Holy Spirit. His gifts for ministry are available to us also through the Holy Spirit. We are already in Christ's kingdom, or the kingdom of God, or the kingdom of heaven. All of those are referring to the same thing. That's the first stage. So the second stage is when Christ returns in the clouds with power and glory to reign forever, according to verse 33. And that's coming. And we, his followers, were, were longing for that day. That's the message. That's the message that Mary will bear a son and that he will be called Jesus. And now let's go to the miracle. Let's look at verse 34. It says, how can this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. Now don't think that just because this is ancient times that these people are ignorant or gullible, or superstitious, any more than people are today. Now, Mary wasn't an idiot. She, did, she didn't stop thinking. She didn't turn off her brain. She knew enough biology to know something's missing. And she has questions. And Gabriel is okay with those questions. Which tells me it's okay for people to have questions about faith. Think things through. Talk about it. Now let's compare this story of, of Mary questioning a conception without a man. Let's compare that to the previous story of Zechariah questioning a conception to an older couple. Same angel, similar question. Gabriel is okay with Mary's question, but Zechariah gets punished. If you remember that, he became, wasn't able to talk till the baby was born. So 
Wouldn't we say that Gabriel was a little bit unfair to Zechariah? Maybe he was having a bad day. Do angels have bad days? Do they get grumpy? I hope not. Mary didn't say, who is the man that's going to be involved in making this baby? She didn't say that. And to me, that says that she believed Gabriel. But she had some obvious biological questions. We would have done the same thing. We would have asked some questions. But Zachariah's questions showed that he didn't believe the angel, and therefore he was punished. Let me ask you, have you ever had God speak to you and you thought, no, that, that is just not possible? You, you had some serious doubts. You didn't know, how is, this, how is that going to work? He asked you to do something or go somewhere, and, and you had serious doubts. How is this all going to come together? You ever had something like that? If you heard this story, please forgive me, but it just stands out in, in my memory. When God called us to the mission field, I, there was no doubt about his calling. I had no doubt about his calling, but it was still somewhat terrifying. The problem is we had to raise our own monthly financial support, and I looked at the amount, and I just said, that is a Mount Everest of money to raise. How in the world is that ever going to happen? Skipping some details. God showed me through Scripture, and I'll summarize it like this. If you have faith, the money will come in. If you don't have faith, the money won't come in. Despite my small faith, all the money came in, and we went life-changing experience. Is God calling you to do something that seems impossible? It's okay to ask Him questions. It's not okay to doubt or to give up. Verse 35 explains the method of Christ's conception, which has never happened before and will never happen again. Let's read it. Verse 35, the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born to you, so the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. The virgin birth is essential to the Christian faith. It's on our statement of faith right when you walk in. It is extremely important. Now this, the virgin birth, that's not a metaphor that's not something we as Christians should be embarrassed about when that comes up maybe in the secular world because, you know, they think miracles, well, that's just crazy. You can't prove that scientifically. This is a true story. 700 years earlier, the Isaiah, Isaiah the prophet prophesied that this would happen. In Isaiah 7:14. he says, The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. 700 years before. Why did Jesus have to be born to a virgin? I found a, a simple explanation. In God's sovereign wisdom, it was the only way for his son to enter the world and become fully human, yet also remain fully God. It was important that Jesus was fully human. He had to be able to face everything that we face and yet be sinless. And thus that made him the only one worthy to be the perfect sacrifice, absorbing God's judgment for our sin. I know that's a lot to take in. Let me say that again. He had to be able to face everything we face and yet be sinless, thus making him the only one worthy to be that perfect sacrifice, absorbing God's judgment for our sin. And he had, he had to be able to die physically. That's why he had to be human. It is also important that Jesus was fully God and that he had a divine nature. Had Jesus been fathered by Joseph, he would, have been born, he would have been born with a sin nature, as we are. One Bible teacher put it like this. The virgin birth is important because it shows that salvation must come from God. Humanity cannot produce our own Redeemer. It says the Holy Spirit will come on you 
and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Now that word overshadow is drawn from an idea in the Old Testament where God's presence and His glory overshadowed the tabernacle like a, a divine cloud. God allowed Himself to be confined in time and space. So here in Luke 1, instead of, instead of God's presence and power in a place, like the tabernacle, it's in a person. It's infused into a person, into Mary. And this is a miracle that, by God, that humans cannot fully comprehend. But maybe the closest we can get to really understanding this is when we see the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in someone's life. Have you ever seen that? Have you ever seen the power and presence of the Holy Spirit in someone's life? Or have you experienced it yourself? The Holy Spirit tugging at your heart. Conviction. A prompting. No explanation except the Holy Spirit. In the last few weeks, I have had three people confess to me something that they have thought or said. That is not normal. That's uncomfortable. There's no explanation except the conviction from the power of the Holy Spirit and then acting on it in the power of the Holy Spirit. Verse 36, Gabriel gives another example that God can do the impossible and he tells Mary about her, her uh, relative Elizabeth who is uh, pregnant even though she's well past her childbearing years. And then we come to the end of the story where Mary gives a response. Now what is she going to do? She could just say no and all of this is over, could avoid all the drama, or she could accept this role. And if she did that, what would happen? Hmm, according to the law of Moses, if a groom found out that his wife, that his bride was pregnant before the wedding, he could bring charges against her in court, and if she's found guilty, she would be stoned to death. Or he could divorce her without bringing those charges before the court, just simply end the marriage and spare the life of the woman and the unborn child. Now Mary lived in a small town, Nazareth. I showed you a picture of it, and it was even smaller back then. That was a traditional society. And come on, there's got to be small town gossip. I mean, we have it today. I'm sure they had it back then. Can you imagine what was said? You know, this pregnant teenager, she would have lost whatever reputation she had. She'd always be known as this girl who had sex before marriage and had this illegitimate child. And Jesus would be known as that illegitimate child. And her explanation, I'm sure, would be mocked then as it, as it would be now. Oh, she claims to be a virgin and that God made her pregnant. The nerve of that girl blaming God for her sin. The explanation would go all around town. Well, either she's been unfaithful to her betrothed Joseph or her and Joseph had sex outside of marriage. It's got to be one or the other. So either way, she's guilty. And I expect not even her parents believed her. She was probably ridiculed and rejected by those who knew her. If Joseph rejected, refused to marry her, she would likely have remained a single mom for the rest of her life. If her father had rejected her, the only way for her to make an income would be begging or selling her body on the streets. Mary didn't even hesitate. I am the Lord's servant. Does she really know what she's getting into? Does she know that her baby is going to grow up and he's going to be opposed and abused and tortured and, and face injustice and executed? I mean, that would tear a mom's heart apart. I am the Lord's servant. May, may your word to me be fulfilled. She had no idea of the agony and the cost that this was going to be in her life. She had no idea what she was in for, and yet she said yes anyway. Whatever costs, I'm willing. Wow, that's faith. 
or is it foolishness? Think about it, Mary. A life of disgrace ahead of you. If you agree to this, no hesitation. God told her that he would be with her. That was enough. God showed remarkable favor on Mary by offering her the position to be the mother of the Messiah. No training, no preparation for what lay ahead, just this promise that he would be with her. And she was willing and available. She had faith that God would give her the spiritual and the emotional strength that for whatever lay ahead. So let me ask you, what is God asking of you? Is he asking you to do something that just seems beyond your limitations? Oh, I'm not trained for it. I'm not trained. I'm not prepared. Maybe there's a big life change ahead. I don't know. Maybe he's convicting you right now, asking you to stop running. Stop running. Humble yourself and submit to him and receive salvation. Or to take that step of obedience in baptism. Is he calling you into ministry? Oh, but I have a wife and kids and a house. Houses can be bought and sold. Kids can change schools. I'm not saying it's easy, but it's been done. It's possible. I'm praying that this church will send out someone full-time to live at Punachai and help Daniel in the cool north. That's one of my prayers. Is the Holy Spirit calling you? Maybe he's calling you to confess something or to step it up in your marriage or to deal with that addiction or end that toxic relationship. What is he urging you to do? The real question is, will you answer that call? Are you willing to say to the Lord like Mary, I'm your servant? About 33 years later, her child, Jesus, now a man, was in the Garden of Gethsemane. His father, his father had a mission for him. Jesus did know the spiritual and physical agony that lay ahead, yet he humbled himself as a servant and he said, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me, yet not my will, but yours be done. Similar to what his mother said in Luke 1. The Son of the Most High became a willing sacrifice for the sins of all people. So how will you respond? Is He calling you to surrender your life to Him? To serve Him? To honor Him? To worship? Let's sing in response. I'll call the music team up. Let's sing again. Oh, come, let us adore Him. <laughs>